Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. Once an Air Education and Training Command asset, Tyndall has been home to every F-22 pilot in the Air Force. If you're going to get into the F-22 community, it starts here in the 43rd. This is Raptor Country. It's king of the hill. It's the best airplane man's ever made, without a doubt. Uh, I used to fly a, a the F-16. It's a phenomenal fighter. It still is. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, the F-22 is just a step even greater than that. There's nothing in the sky that can match its capability. The emotion that you have is one of, A, I can't believe I get to do this. And then I do distinctly remember just being amazed at how much I could see and observe and the freedom of maneuver that you have that you just don't have on the ground. After the first one, I, I was amazed at that freedom of maneuver, and then I was really happy to be back on the ground. <laughs> you see everything that's going on. The enemy doesn't see you. Uh, it's a completely unfair fight, and it's great to be on this side of it, that's for sure. It's only been a few years since Tyndall has become an Air Combat Command asset, but its mission has always been in the sky. It has always been in the fighter business, and has always been in the training business here at Tyndall. When I was uh, last stationed here, I left here in 2010, and at that time it was Air Education and Training Command. It had a uh, unique uh, training role. So that aspect of that it, it was and still is extremely important. Um, it's the only F-22 training unit on the planet, um, and it trains aircrafts that fly a very small fleet of unique fighters, and so we've got to get that right, and, uh, and we do. The challenge is to be able to do both of those missions and keep the balance of your wing uh, assets and your wing focus on, on both of those things. The, the training mission is critical and it, and it pays dividends in the long term, whereas the combat mission potentially is much more short term uh, and you know the squadron could deploy at a moment's notice. We have an incredible team, we really do, and we talk about uh, lines of effort within the wing. Um, and so each individual in the wing really plays a role in probably all those lines of effort, although they're more heavily invested in one than the other. For example, an instructor in our training squadron is heavily invested in training the future of air dominance, but they play a tangential role in each of those other lines of effort. Lori Bortz. I'm an instructor air battle manager here at uh, the 337th Air Control Squadron. As an air battle manager instructor, uh, I'm training the next generation of air battle managers uh, to work with international officers and perform any mission that the Air Force has tasked for us. So the role of an air battle manager is to orient and pair, pair shooters, solve problems, uh, potentially reroll assets, uh, bring order to the fight, uh, so fighting through the, the fog and friction of war, as well as uh, speeding decisions and up-channel assessments to higher headquarters, uh, potentially getting clearance to fire as well from higher headquarters. That motor swap is just kicking up us all day. And about time to leave, we're like, you know, we spent all day trying to get it done. And we're not just gonna walk out now. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, like you let the job beat you in a way. That's what I like about this job. It's um, you take a lot of pride in your work and your jet. To me, a maintainer is. Can I be arrogant about it? <laughs> your flight line handyman. Not like a grease monkey, you know. You got an 18, 19 year old uh, airman, male or female, who is given a 187 million dollar airplane, one of the most sophisticated airplanes in the Air Force arsenal. The backbone of the Air Force, I think so, entirely. Is that a metal or a composite? I don't think you just have it on you one day on the side. Nah, I think that's metal. You think so? What's your, what's your proof on that? It sounds metal. I'll show you how you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm still, I'm still learning. I have a lot to learn, you know, I'm the class I came in with, um, we're we're still the new guys, you know. So we're trying to, you know, gain our respect on the flight line, you know, earn our earn our position, you know. So I, that's about where we're at right now. You know, we're still trying to get in, you know, you know, wiggle our way in. 
I mean, we have a, a lot of three levels and a lot of five levels in the AMU who are really just working way above what they should be asked to do and they're succeeding greatly. Uh, learning a lot, but also yeah, performing at a high level. Surviving the flight line is about having snacks. <laughs> These airmen are uh, better trained, better equipped, better resourced than, uh, than it was when I come in. And uh, you know, the, the, the airmen are a lot smarter when I come in. And a lot of these uh, airmen out here are three levels and five levels with you know less than five years of experience out here, many new to the jet. So it's it's really eye-opening. Yes, so I was right. Yes, but that's how you can tell. I'm Technical Sergeant Anthony Morris, and I'm the NCIC of fuels distribution for the fuels flight here at Tender Air Force Base. Here comes the hot pit refueling. I see us as the most significant. Of course, you got to have the maintenance guys to, to fix it, um, you know, and the crew chiefs to, to kind of take care of it. And the pilot can't drop bombs. I mean, he has to drop the bombs, but just like a car, you can have all the best maintenance on it in the world, but if you run out of gas, you're not driving. Basically, a hot pit, refueling, cuts sortie time regeneration in half, sometimes by about 70%. If we're in a wartime situation or any other situation where we got to get aircraft back airborne to be able to go do their mission wherever they're needing to go, we fuel aircraft with engines running, they pull up, they're allowed to receive fuel and go right back out onto the runway and take off. To know that we play that big of a part supporting the, the 43rd there and making sure that their pilots receive the training that they need is huge to me because then that basically helps us, lets me know that we're doing our job to make sure that the Air Force is getting the best pilots in the world to be able to go out there and defend this country and that's what it's all about. I love the Air Force. Being able to, to look back and say, okay, this guy got here, they had no idea what they were doing. Like they weren't even confident enough to drive on the, on the flight line because you know we didn't know if they would cut off a jet or if they do something crazy. So to see them progress from that manner, now they're out there, they're pumping gas. To see the knowledge that they're gaining, we're putting them through rotational training, like laboratory training, where they're learning how to test fuel, uh, cryogenics training, where they're learning about different chemicals like liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, things like that. And to see their curiosity and the fact that they care, that's the biggest thing for me. Tech Sergeant Bryce Hamilton and the Mayor Traffic Controller. Our role as the air traffic controllers here in the F-22 mission is kind of like the liaison between them training because all pilots that fly the F-22 come through Tyndall in one way or another to get all their flight training here. So we're the ones that enable them to go out there, do their different types of missions and stuff like that, practice flying in the pattern to get up to speed and uh, hone their skills in order to go out into the actual combat when they need to go and fly for the Air Force. Air Traffic Control is one of those uh, unique jobs where every day you come in it's going to be something different. For instance here, us in the tower, we uh, control all the airspace from to the surface up to 2,500, 2,600 feet. So all the airplanes that are, the RAPCON's talking to, they pass them to us and we control them, land them, take them off, all that stuff and get them headed in the right direction out to go into the airspace that they're going to be working with. You just got to have confidence in yourself. You know, before I would say I was more of a, a passive type person. I just, this job has definitely made me grow that I need to, you know, step out on that limb that you're not uncomfortable doing and do those things that you're not, I wasn't used to doing and being strong, be that leader, make the right decision. We all have our uh, key to the puzzle because everybody relies on each other in order to get the mission done. The kid in me comes out every time I look at that jet. It's just a huge piece of machinery. It looks like a big toy. Uh, yeah, every time I'm around it, seeing, seeing it fly through the air, it's just awe-inspiring to me. And there's still a little part of me that doesn't believe I'm gonna get a shot to fly it. The excitement part is this is one of the coolest airplanes that I've ever seen in my life, and I'm just stoked to get a chance to fly it. The uh, anxious part about it is 
ultimately the first time I fly it, all the responsibility will be on me. So a little bit of nerve wracking, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. You know, I wanted to be a fighter pilot since I was a real little kid. I remember building models of F-16s and going to see air shows with the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds, and I thought it was the coolest thing. My parents were both in aviation. My dad was a pilot. My mom was an air traffic controller brother. Uh, he's, he's a pilot right now. and So aviation was always in the blood, but my path of life just took me a little bit different direction. I went to college and decided I wanted to be a cop, and then decided I wanted to go to law school, so I went to law school. And then at some point I wanted to serve, so I applied to be a JAG for the Air Force, and, and I got a summer internship out at Mountain Home Air Force Base, and watching F-15s fly by every single day. It rekindled the, the fire to try to be a, a fighter pilot, so. The process for people to, to end up being a Raptor driver is long. Once you get your commission, after you have your four-year degree, uh, you have to get fortunate enough to be selected for a pilot slot. At that point, if you get the fighter track, you'll go for another six to seven months and you'll learn to fly the T-38, which is a supersonic trainer jet, uh, and you'll learn the basics of you know, flying faster and the basics of uh, fighter-type flying, uh, if you will. Typical pilot training is a year. It took me 15 months longer than a year. I had a little medical hiccup in between T-6s and T-38s. I was diagnosed with cancer, and from there, it was an immediate grounding. I didn't think I was ever going to fly again. I wasn't sure really what to expect for the treatment itself. I didn't think there was anything wrong, to be quite honest. I had one small lump on my neck, and Robin's parents are in the medical field. Her dad's a doctor and mom's a nurse, and they both took a look at the lump, and they said, hey, you should probably get it checked out. And This was after I had said it like three times. True, I'm just saying. true, yeah. <laughs> After the T6 phase was complete, I went and saw a doctor, and they sent me to a specialist who took some biopsies of, of the lump itself. And ultimately, it was inconclusive until I'd started T38, and I got right into the T38 training about the soul of the jet, and the news finally came back that it was cancer. It was rough, but knowing Rob, he never felt sorry for himself. He never got depressed or anything. It was what you would expect when you've been diagnosed with cancer. But he never really was like, oh, woe is me, and played you know, this sad card. So my, it was a struggle for me to watch him deal with not knowing where he stood with the Air Force. He wanted to be a pilot. That was his dream. That's what he wanted to do. And now it wasn't necessarily in the cards. And that was really hard for him to watch that slip away because he would see in his eyes it just wasn't he just didn't know and not knowing is the hardest part sometimes as soon as the news dropped that i was diagnosed with cancer the commander at that time lieutenant colonel moon saw me into his office and said hey your your primary job at this point is just to get healthy he's like i don't even want to see you until you are healthy and all the treatments are done and so there's a regulation that said that I was supposed to be disenrolled after six months of being off of flying status. And they essentially said, hey, we're going to submit a waiver for this guy to get him back into pilot training. And we're not going to disenroll him until we hear back on that waiver. And that was a huge blessing for me, too. So I had 15 months worth of time to wait for the waiver where I could continue to study. And, and they continued to give me jobs and make sure that I was gainfully employed with the Air Force so that I could indeed get reinstated into pilot training. After 15 months of chemo and radiation treatment with his wife by his side, Captain Hansen beat cancer and went right back to pursuing his dream of flying. It's been an emotional roller coaster in some ways. Um, really high, like high highs with the, you know, he almost got to solo the T-38 before he was diagnosed and then he was diagnosed, so low, low. Then he beat the cancer and then we didn't know if he was going to get back in and that would have broken his heart, which would have broken my heart. and then. He got back in, and then, you know, here we are. Yeah. About to get really, really high again. <laughs> that assignment night for, was pretty yeah, cool, too, when really we finally... Yeah, just the moment when it was finally my turn to get my assignment, and I'm in front of this big crowd, and, yeah, there's some instructor pilots that are basically telling you, telling the crowd some of your, your mistakes in pilot training, and 
So you're just sitting there and I had a little bit of a buzz going and a little bit anxious and excited. And the moment was finally about to arrive and the SNR, the senior national representative, gets to announce what aircraft I get. And so It was an amazing moment. And I think until the next morning when I saw the patch on my flight suit that they gave me on a time of night, I don't think it really quite set in that I was going to get a shot to fly the Raptor. How's uh, 8-9 doing? How's 8-9 doing? So when's that flying again? 8-9? Yes, so that's my jet. Well, uh, that's good. Now, as a crew chief, you take, you take pride in your jet, you know, because that's, at the end of the day, the crew chief owns that jet. My jet is Aircraft 107. Aircraft 93. Aircraft 81. 94. 72. 76. 91. My jet is Aircraft 105. My plane specifically? Yeah. It's beautiful. I call my jet the ugly duckling because, um, it's not the prettiest plane, the LO's real damaged on it, but it never really breaks. So, you know, when another jet needs a part, they, they know they can can it from May 9. It's gonna show something about your personality and your character. If your jet's clean, looks good all the time. It'd be like on your car, if you notice your engine oil lights on. Well, hey, maybe I need to add some engine oil, but you just keep driving, you know. It's, you're neglecting your vehicle. You wouldn't do that to a, a sports car. Why, why would I do that to my jet out here? Every time I'm put out on my jet, I, uh, I wash it. I, I scrub down the whites. I wash any dirty part of the jet I can see. No, actually, my first, my first day on the, you know, on the flight line, Sergeant uh, De La O, he showed me the importance of wiping down your whites. Took that to heart a little bit. It's yours, you maintain it, you fix it. It's yours, your name's on it. Uh, okay, you won't find that in the civilian world. Think about you as 18 year old. Where was you at, 18 year olds? Did you have the stakes as high as these men and women have out here? APU! You know, every day once you put a pilot in the air, that pilot's life is in your hands. So that's, that's very gratifying, knowing that you know, you're keeping somebody safe even though you, you know you may not always think of it that way, they may not always think of it that way. But it's always that that, that is the case. You know, you you hold somebody's life in your work.